All right, boys. Your personal opinions. What do you consider the great American novel? I, I kind of thought about this because it's uh, it's it's weird. If we're talking personal opinion, like I was a, a huge fan of Infinite Jest uh, for a very long time in high school and college, which is not surprising to anyone. Uh, and there are a couple of contenders in terms of, you know, I, I gravitated toward Great Gatsby when I was young. As I got older, I gravitated toward uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, which I think is probably uh, a very strong contender for that title. But uh, at the end of the day, when I'm thinking of the great American novel and, you know, something that represents uh, the country and kind of defines the country in the same way that like Joyce's Ulysses defines Ireland. Um, I keep going back whenever something happens in this country. I keep going back to Huckleberry Finn. Uh, I know that seems like an obvious answer. Hemingway, uh, of course, said uh, that, you know, every piece of American literature uh, goes back to Huckleberry Finn. And there, there hasn't been any there wasn't anything as good before and there wasn't anything as good since. But it's true. Like there's so many things. So much of what America is and and how we how the sense of American exceptionalism uh, just destroys us and leaves us uh, ignorant and susceptible. And it just it so perfectly captures the moment that, it, it you know, or it so perfectly captures the country outside of any particular moment, whereas something like Gatsby or Infinite Jest or, or um, Don DeLillo's Underworld or any of them are kind of of a moment, Huckleberry Finn stays kind of prescient even more than a century later. So I think, I think The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is, is as close to the great American novel as we have. Uh, my pick is going to be a more modern pick because um, I think it's a book that really a lot of classics like Huck Finn or The uh, uh, Great Gatsby or anything like that were ever really able to kind of get their heads around in very specific ways, but also just in the grander ways that only grew more pronounced as Amer the American experiment has grown on. And it's, um, I'm going to go with uh, the stand by Stephen King. I think, uh, the last year, if anything has shown how right on the money he get, he gets America. And, um, while he's a great writer and even in this book paints very much in, uh, in gray, uh, ultimately showing that when the shit hits the fan, there is just going to be black and white good and evil and if anything the last year has shown when a big old virus has turned our world upside down uh plenty of people are going to try to do the right thing putting on masks listening to mother abigail and a lot of people are acting like damn fools being selfish egotistical just absolute id infested monsters heading for las vegas because the man the walking dude randall flag said it's all about us now, baby. Who cares about the rules? And um, just, I mean, just even in like, because like the first like 300 pages of the book is just like showing how specifically America would fall apart in a pandemic and just how right on the money it was. And the very American characters that take up the book. Uh I know every, I mean, you know, there's no Trump character like Randall Flagg. You, you could twist and break your neck trying to say, oh, he's like Donald Trump. And yeah, he's the figurehead of everything wrong, but he's not Trump. But there is very much just, it's just the last year of anything. And uh, Stephen King is probably the best living, at least the most important living American author. Uh, and not, many people wouldn't ever give him the credit in terms of these kind of conversations because, oh, he's the genre writer. He's the pulp writer. He's a populist writer. I kind of challenge anyone to throw forth a book that is as timely, as relevant, and as well observed of how Americans uh, react under pressure, under, you know, in, in the best of times, in the worst of times, with love, with hate, with everything. I think the stand... <laughs> Kind of hard to top, in my opinion. Grab the family. We're heading out to California and also talking 1940s The Grapes of Wrath here on You're Missing Out with special guest Mark Russell. Our guest today is the author of God is Disappointed in You, a modern retelling of the Bible, as well as several comic books, including The Flintstones, Exit Stage Left, The Snagglepuss Chronicles, 
Billionaire Island, and Second Coming, among others. Mark Russell joins us today. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Welcome to the show, Mark. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, just want to say, big fan of your work as a uh, comic book artiste. Uh, <laughs> big, big fan, so it's nice having you on, man. Well, thanks. You know, I, I've got a lot more time for these sorts of things now that uh, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Why, is something going on? <laughs> yeah, there's a few things. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to have you here. Um, you and I have, have spoken a couple times. We've done a couple of convention panels uh, in the past. I've moderated a couple yes. of uh, con panels out here in New York, uh, which has been kind of fun. I think the first one I did, Snagglepuss, was like in progress. I believe my favorite thing, I mentioned this the last panel we did, but my favorite thing was when you went, so I got this book second coming, coming out. I, you know, I, I hope people check it out. And then uh, that became the sensation that it was. Uh, it was very was a very cool thing to to hear the early stages of yeah that was pre-feigned outrage uh <laughs> period the second coming it was uh feigned outrage we don't have anything like that today we've all <laughs> everybody's calm and rational and not hypocritical at all in there yeah, as much as as fox news complains about cancel culture I, I bet few of them have ever had like a uh a, a petition signed by half a million people to, to shut down their comic book no you know what the funny thing was i was about to make a joke of like i was going to pretend that that was about some inoffensive book but every every book you've done has some kind of hot button uh quality to it which is part of what has drawn uh me to your work and tom to your work and so many people is that is that it is even when you're tackling you know hanna-barbera characters it's always some kind of unflinching piece of satire which is is just so great I, i'm a really big fan and i'm really glad you're you're here for this well thank you i think the my secret sauce is that i really don't have much tact that i'm, I'm very blunt <laughs> about what it is i have to say and I, yeah i think that's 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 my my charm to the extent that i have any is that um i'm i'm, I'm just very blunt and i don't see the need for a lot of like artifice or subtlety i'll just come out and say what it is i want to talk about Certainly a good to have these days, since any sort of subtlety is uh, not met with any kind of welcoming embrace. Because if you're subtle, then that means you're actively uh, promoting the thing you're apparent you're supposed to be critiquing, and then we are going to throw you onto a giant ice floe and push you out into the ocean. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's it's good to just know right off the bat that okay, I'm not going to be subtle here. This is what I believe. Do not bad faith attack me. Yeah, I, I, I've come to sort of associate subtlety with uh, trying to get away with something as like having some probably some really shitty opinions that you're just not willing to that you're not willing to go on record for. So uh, I think if you if you stand by the convictions of which you're of what you're talking about, you should be as as clear about it as possible. Winston Churchill once said, you don't make a point with a feather, you make it with a sledge. And that's why, you know, and it's, it's true, it would take a real idiot to kind of misinterpret one of your works. And yet they do. Which is why I thought it was so bold that Billionaire Island is a pro-billionaire book. I think that was, uh, you know, that's that's what it was, <laughs> yeah. right? It's, it's very pro. Yeah. It's, a, it's lifestyle porn. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the it, it, uh, clearly a great endorsement of trickle-down economics, if ever I've seen one. Well, I, I know I came away from it just loving rich people even more. I, <laughs> I I want my taxes to be raised even more so they can live even more comfortably. Eventually, we'll all be like serving business dog and be happier for it. See, that's that's the one thing I I, I will say. I'm okay with serving business dog. Business dog is the only billionaire I support. You know, I'm well, all, he's, I'm an all... A, he's an agent of chaos, and I'm <laughs> I'm big. I'm a big fan of agents of chaos's uh, little stinkers and. Uh, if if I have to go down the tubes, then uh, at least it's because a dog ate uh, a bad batch of dog food and threw up everywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm you know actually more on board with business dog than I am with you know what we see now with uh, you know like a, a, a predatory short sell attempt of uh, GameStop stock being uh, blown up by a uh, by a pump and dump scam. It, it, to me, there's this like there's there's no good ending to any of that. You know, the, the pure randomness of business dog choosing which stocks to invest in based upon which bowl he eats out of is like a, a much more orderly, sane approach in comparison. I just I, I have to take a moment and I'm assuming that most people who are, are tuning in are, you know, see your name and are fans of your work. But I want to believe there's like a couple of lone Steinbeck fans just going, oh, the grapes of wrath and hearing about business dog throwing up and going, what the fuck? What am I yeah, getting into? I what is that this? <laughs> I mean, I, I would argue that, uh, you know, maybe they think we're talking about Travels with Charlie. Who knows? Um, Good book. That's, 
for all the uh, for all the Steinbeck heads out there. B- Billionaire Island is at the time of recording uh, the latest. Uh, it's out now in in trade paperback, uh, and that's kind of where this all came from. Because when I knew we were doing this first season of the show, uh, I mean, I'd wanted to get you on a podcast of mine going going way back. You know, we just never figured out. But when I knew we were doing Grapes of Wrath, I thought, well, there's the perfect that that lines up perfectly. You're you know you are at the time when we were planning out this show. Uh, Billionaire Island was in progress, and here you are, kind of tackling the current economic crisis in in the same way that Steinbeck, uh, you know, chronicled the economic crisis of his time, albeit again with with more yeah. business dogs and and mannequin wives. Yeah, and I think that yeah, with, with the, where the two sort of dovetail is that they they're about how wealth is ultimately about the control of other people's lives. It's not really, it, to a certain extent, it might be about making your own life better, but 90% of it is about trolling others. I, so can I ask, I, I want to, out of curiosity, before we get into the film itself, where did, for you, where did Billionaire Island come from? What was the, what was the, the first thought or image or, or plot point that occurred to you from which that, that whole uh, series sprung? Well, the... The seed that originally germinated the idea for the story was uh, an article I read. Billionaires who made their fortunes off of, like fossil fuels and uh, you know climate denial and and uh, resource depletion on the planet were the ones who were most likely to survive the calamity that they were themselves causing. So I wanted to write a, a bigger story about that. And I'd also written had previously written, which I had intended to use in my old comic book series Prez, but never really got a chance to. A story about a billionaire who basically just cages journalists and anyone who crosses them in a hamster cage, where he treats them like hamsters, like giving them food through their little slot, you know, three times a day and having a giant tank uh, for them to suckle from for water and a, and a wheel. as sort of a metaphor for uh, the uh, for the genteel middle class and how we are sort of like kept pets by the billionaire class. So... I had already written that thing, so the two ideas just sort of dovetailed in Billionaire Island. It's a uh, great, great series from, uh, you know, you're now working you, with uh, with Ahoy Comics, right? That's where, that's Billionaire yeah, Island Ahoy and Second Coming. Yeah, publishes both Billionaire Island and Second Coming. And there's a new volume of Second Coming come, I don't know how to phrase that sentence. Uh, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's a, a forthcoming second, second Coming. It's, a, it's uh, called Second Coming, Only Begotten Son. And, uh, the second series of Second Coming, which I know is confusing, uh, but but the second issue of the second series of Second Coming actually comes out next Wednesday. So, well, I mean, at the time of recording this, yeah. I, so, so just to be clear, you uh, decided to continue Second Coming solely so the people like me would have to say the second Second Coming coming. Yeah, right. But I'm I'm so glad. You know, I I left Billionaire Island. It was the perfect uh, match for this. So before. Before we get into the film and the themes of the film, I want to ask, what was your? Had you? I mean, I'm assuming had you had you read Steinbeck's book before? Had you seen the film before? I had seen both versions of the film, and I had read the book, but not since high school. Tom, was this your first time seeing the film? You're a big John Ford guy, but was this your first time seeing the film? And had you read the book before? Uh, yes, yeah, so this was the first time seeing the film. At a certain point, uh, by the time we relaunched this, I figured I might as well just wait until we got to it to watch it. Never read the book, surprisingly enough. Didn't get to it in high school, and uh, I was even in an elective in senior year where it was just reading books. And it's not even like, oh, English composition and all this. It's like, no, we're just reading books, and we still didn't even get to it. So um makes me want to read the book. Uh, spoiler alert, it's a good, good, good book, good movie, good story, <laughs> and uh, I quite liked it. So we're, let's uh, before we get into more of, of uh, why we think this film matters, let's talk about why the National Film Registry thinks the film matters. This is what they had to say. John Ford's Oscar-winning depiction of Okies flocking to California in droves during the Depression was based on John Steinbeck's bestseller, seen by many as more respectable than Ford's later westerns, but Greg Tolan's stark photography and Henry Fonda's memorably penetrating performance as hero Tom Joad elevate it to American artistry. So that's what the registry had to say. Uh, sometimes they give us paragraphs, sometimes they give us two sentences. Um, and in fact, it's that statement and the brevity of that statement that I find so interesting. Because to start this off, I do want to address the weird thing, and we brought it up once before on our 
uh, episode about the crowd with David Sims, but the original induction class, the National Film Registry, uh, the original selections were made in 1989. So this film was selected in 1989 as one of the 25 most essential American films to go on the registry. And I find it interesting that in 1989, it was viewed as, well, of course, The Grapes of Wrath, this fundamental American film. And now I don't think it has the critical or popular cachet as it did 30 years ago. I mean, the fact that it has just, uh, you know, I, I feel like the, the fact that it has just the three sentences that it has, or two sentences that it has in its description, seem to suggest, well, of course, the grapes of wrath. You know how it is. You know you know why it's there. And I, I'm curious, uh, you know, and to see if we can get to the bottom of why it is that this film that was once hailed as the great American movie has lost its place in the popular consciousness. If, if it has, I, I feel like it perhaps has, but I don't know if you guys feel that same way. I think that in a lot of ways, this is sort of the fate of classic films in general and that people tend to think of belongs in, in, in its time or, you know, they, they kind of view it as the same way they view requir required reading where they associate it with like something they saw when they were learning to appreciate film, but then not something they really appreciate after after you know, after that point, after that sort of formative period of their or development as a as a cultural being. You know, I do. It, it is funny because even at this point, like I love John Ford. I love plenty of his movies. And uh, I still was like kind of going into this expecting like, OK, this is kind of going to be homework. You know, it's the John. It's a, about the Dust Bowl and all of this. And it's going to kind of be slow and boring or whatever. And I should have known better because I watched it and it's an easy watch. It's fun. It's sad and tragic at, at most points. But there is that John Ford sense of like, look at this rowdy bunch of characters just going on an adventure, <laughs> kind of. And I, I do think there there that sense of homework is a big part of what's kind of hounded it uh, since 89. Uh, I do also have to wonder though if uh, a big part of it is that we've become a lot more aware in the information age of uh just how apparently conservative john ford was and the sort of contradiction that exists of him directing this movie maybe kind of makes people look at this movie as if it was i don't know kind of like a class traitor or something like it's not exactly pure I don't know. It, it, that seems like maybe people are just anti-Ford now. And I wonder how much of that, to, to speak to your point, Tom, you know, on the opposite of that, I also feel like there is a, a weird attitude on Steinbeck, especially recently, that kind of treats him as lesser. I mean, you know, the, the, the kind of weirdly conventional wisdom when people talk about, yeah, I mean, he won the Nobel Prize, but that was kind of like, you know, like people talk about his Nobel Prize win as though it was undeserved. And that he is not one of the quintessential American authors, and I like he won the Super Bowl during a strike year or something. Yeah, exactly. It's that very. It's very weird. Like you know, like he just won the Super Bowl against Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> but and I think in a lot of ways he kind of was the victim of his of how influential he was because once he sort of showed that you could write eloquently, you know, using very simple syntax and talking like like normal people. It, it sort of be, that minimalism sort of became de rigueur for a while. So now he's kind of viewed as quaint by the very people who are influenced by him. I think. And I wonder too, I, and this is something I was discussing with the, the guys before on Mike, but I think about the fact that now, Mark, you said you, you read, you had to read Grapes of Wrath in school. Mm -hmm. See now we, uh, in my public school, we didn't read Grapes of Wrath. And I don't know people, I, I was talking to some people around my age who were in even the honors classes, and like Tom was saying, like, we didn't read Grapes of Wrath. When we read Steinbeck, it was always of mice and men. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, that was that was like you had to choose one of those books. Like you had to choose, uh, I think, of mice and men, Grapes of Wrath, or um, uh, gosh, what was the third one? Um, anyway, and, and not knowing any better, I, I, I chose Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I also it's it's something where I I look at that and I can't help but wonder if. 
I, I can't help but wonder if part of the reason why Grapes of Wrath has fallen out of favor is a conscious choice on the part of some people in terms of, you know, of Mice and Men is a very straightforward story of here's yeah. two guys, they go to this farm, the one guy's kind of a big, strong idiot, and he kills a girl and he gets shot, and it doesn't ask you to grapple with the socialist politics and economic uh, right you know issues of grapes of wrath and I, it's more if it's it comes up more as a personal story than as a, a political or social story and that might be why it has much more longevity because i think people tend to think of like the politics of the great depression as being something specific to that time rather than sort of universal issues of like wealth inequality and and exploitation and it's it's you know just that story of of mice and men is kind of easier for an education system that has continued to treat kids with uh you know pun intended kids gloves that they keep dumbing down the curriculum instead of challenging them and i mean it's i I remember being in high school and kind of you know it was an easy story mice and men it was not you know you didn't get uh, too caught up or you didn't get bored it was like short sweet and to the point yeah. and you know there was a there was a murder in it like yeah we're high school kids like yeah whatever and like grapes of wrath like i haven't read the book but just like seeing the the, the movie and re- doing research that it doesn't really chop the book to shreds or anything but like that wouldn't have been f- i mean the way we were going to school that wouldn't have been fun to read because it would have just yeah. been like Jesus Christ, this is sad. Yeah. I don't want to be right. sad in school. It's it's like uh, when we were in school, I, you know, we had to sing This Land is My Land, you know, the Woody Guthrie song. But we only sang the, you know, we didn't sing any of the verses about the glories of like trespassing or, <laughs> you know, the, the, the horrors of the man. Uh, you know, and I think in that way, Of My Son Man was, was more easily sanitized into this sort of, uh, this um, universal middle school curriculum. It's funny you mentioned Woody Guthrie because uh, Woody Guthrie uh, actually reviewed this film, Grapes of Wrath. Oh, yeah? Uh, yes, he wrote it for, I forget the, I don't have the title of the publication, but it was a communist publication he was writing for. Well, he also sang songs about Tom Joad. I think he has a song specifically titled Tom yes. Joad. And he described the movie as, quote, the best cussin picture I ever seen. <laughs> so he loved the film. Well, he lived it. He was himself yeah. a cookie who moved to California, like lived in a culvert for a while. Meanwhile, uh, apparently uh, I'll just say, I'll get out of the way uh, Orson Welles did not like the movie and apparently oh, uh, oh, oh, did Orson Welles have some shit to say about other filmmakers? <laughs> uh, apparently he claimed Jack in referring to John Ford, he said Jack turned it into a movie about mother love because uh, obviously the book is a much more sprawling depiction of life in the Dust Bowl the film uh, one of the changes the film makes is it does center itself around just the Jode family. I think most emblemized by the fact that, and this is something that uh, I'm, I'd read the book, but I'm so used to the film now that in my head, I just remembered this being the case in the book. I, I thought that the scene in the diner where, you know, about the, about the bread and the candy, the two for a penny in the movie, that's, that's pa. And I just, I hap, like, I sort of Mandela affected myself into remembering that that's the case in the book, but apparently it's not. It's just an, a different Oki character. But Ford made the decision to kind of center it on the Jode family specifically in this one family's journey rather than a more overall portrait of and the And that's line. probably why. That's pre- exactly why, because the more sort of ensemble the, uh, you know, a story becomes with its characters the the more opportunities there are for confusion in the in the mind of the listener uh the more you begin to sort of homogenize characters and lump them together so i think that's why storytellers especially in like a shorter medium like film tend to sort of group uh you know uh amalgamize characters into individual beings as opposed to having what what it might have been the book like a collection of three or four characters so it's really easy to you know it, they do this in history too. Like uh, I, I read once that you know, the the age of the Roman kings uh, before the Republic, there there the Rome and its like history like list, listed like twelve kings who ruled Rome before it was a republic, but that was a period of five hundred years. So they probably had a lot more than twelve kings, but they they just grouped the deeds of these king of uh, like everything of everyone that was ruling before into like 
the reigns of these 12 kings. So, so I think it's a natural human tendency just to simplify the narrative, which is why I think storytellers try to do that for us in uh, filmmaking. Oh, well, I would, just to you know go to Orson's point about t- he changed it into a movie about mother love, that, that seems to be very much pointed about the ending of the movie and how that's uh, not the ending of the book, that... They couldn't do the ending of the book, basically, because of the way cinema was and the, with the, you know, the code and everything and all that. You couldn't do it. So they needed a different ending. And Zanuck is the one that suggested this ending. And Zanuck said, uh, all right, I'll shoot it. And Ford said, all right, fine, fuck it. I don't care. I'm going to go make five other movies while you're doing that. <laughs> and um, so that's why it ends like that. And uh, like Mark said, you have to kind of condense and you need to find a focus. And Ford found the focus in the Jode family. And then with this new ending, uh, you know, I, I could see why Orson, a man who was always wonderfully uh, friendly with producers who wanted to <laughs> add notes to his movies, I could see why he would be like, no, it should have been just like the book and it should you should have taken no changes at all. But uh, I think, you know, they were right, being that the movie came out less than a year after the movie, after the book was published. Seems like there wasn't uh, much time to fret and hand wring about well, we need to add this, we need to add that. Just sort of like, no, we need to yeah. laser focus here. It still comes across as pretty daring, given the fact that you are, you know, making a movie, you know, and with, with, with Zanuck breathing down your neck in the sort of artistic moray of 1939, you know, it, it, it's it's like, I think Orson Welles comes from, his criticism comes from a place of perfect artistry, where, you know, the, uh, the director is king and should be able to, like, make you know art at the expense of all else that wasn't really the reality though for for any other director and i think that there's also an element of the different mediums and i find that so often when you talk to people who are particularly if they're just big fans of a book and they see an adaptation and go well the book was better because this didn't do this and this didn't do that it's a different medium and as a result with a book you can, you know, very easily place your reader in the head of a character or, or direct their focus to a particular character. You can have uh, one-off scenes here and there. With a movie, you can't really do that. You can't control who's, who's head they're in or who they're lining up with quite the same. So I well, think it, by... It's the battle between interiority and exteriority. Yeah. Movies are very exterior. You can hint at interiority, but those hints come from the exterior, from the look on on someone's face or the way they move. You can't. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with the this you know tried and true notion that uh, voiceover is bad. All voiceover is bad. I mean, Scorsese's made a pretty good career out of saying, "Well, that's dumb," but most movies can't do that. Right. No, it's it's almost impossible to duplicate in the way you would do, be able to do it in a novel, which is mostly interiority, in in a visual medium like film. It would be weird. Yeah, especially because I was thinking about, you know, the uh, and uh, the opening of the book uh, spends the the first couple pages of the book. There's there's a number of pages devoted to just the truck driver's internal conflict about tom joe trying to convince him to ride right that that first shot where it's you know hey can i get a lift oh don't you see the sign no riders well what are they gonna know that there's a whole chunk of this that's that's kind of from the driver's point of view of like well yeah on the one hand he would get in trouble with the boss but on the other hand does he want to be the kind of man that gets in trouble with the boss? and this dispatches with that very quickly uh and just makes it yes he's you know joe gets on the truck it does you know what? What takes so much time in the novel about the the tension and the the truck and all that? It it does it so quickly, but yet I be, I feel like it has the same impact in that moment when one of my favorite parts of the movie, just when Henry Fonda says, "You know, you want to know what I was in for? I'll tell you." And he slams the door and goes, "Homicide!" And you just feel the weight in that moment because you're not expecting. If you don't know the story, you're not expecting homicide. You right. know, you're expecting, from the, yeah, like like someone who's being presented to you as protagonist from protagonist, and also from a cinematic perspective from Henry Fonda. You know, yeah, like just just think about. I mean, I think about the fact that just the year before, people were watching him as the hero of Drums Along the Mohawk, and now he's. I mean, the year before he was playing Abraham Lincoln for John yes. Ford. Yes. Uh, I mean, and also just from the filmmaking of this, you know, you're, you're kind of getting that like, oh, he, he was in prison. What did he for? Oh, he was in prison for four years. What could how bad could it have been? He's Henry Fonda homicide. Wait, what? 
Yeah. Henry Fonda? <laughs> also four years? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to touch on the fact that as we talk about this, and I know we're really focused on Steinbeck, but let, the amazing run that John Ford had that this is a part of in 1939, the big year of Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Ford has Stagecoach, Young Mr. Lincoln, and Drums Along the Mohawk. He follows that up the next year, 1940, with both The Grapes of Wrath and The Long Voyage Home. Then makes Tobacco Road, which is a comedy version of Grapes of Wrath in a sense. Then How Green Was My Valley, which wins Best Picture, beating Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. And then goes off to war and becomes one of the, as the Netflix doc calls it, one of the five that came back. Uh, it's just an incredible run that this just, this is one of so many huge influential films that he makes in a three-year period is just remarkable. Well, and it's just funny, too, just because he is such complete opposites as a filmmaker from Orson in that uh, Ford was never like, yeah, I'm an auteur. When that theory started going around and you'd have like Bogdanovich trying to interview him or whatever, he would just be like, yeah, I just made movies like I just shot the, the pictures. I like whatever, like you're thinking too much about it. He would you know, I mean, he was making three, four movies a year. He yeah. started in silent yeah. pictures. He wasn't a guy who. He wasn't too much of an egotist to be like, oh, I'm a filmmaker, so I am the most important man in the world, and I need to take 12 months to make this movie. He was like, no, let's just get on set and film the goddamn thing. I know how to shoot it. I read the script. Here's how you shoot it. Don't be too sensitive about it. Move on to the next thing. And, uh, you know, there, that, that would lead to some ups and downs in the career. You know, as Mike uh, told me, uh, Tobacco Road was garbage. And Drums Along the Mohawk is a, a weird mess of... Uh... You know, when we did the searchers, we had our back and forth about, well, is it is it commenting on racism or is it racist? Whereas Drums <laughs> Along the Mohawk, you're not having that conversation. It's pretty blunt about which it is. Pretty, uh, didn't, uh there's a reason nobody remembers that one. That's all I'll say. Reason. Yeah, I just, I'd never heard of, uh, Drums Along the Mohawk in, in, until this, this, uh, this podcast <laughs> Can I tell you probably that's has been selectively edited from uh, from cinematic history. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's okay. well when when you when you have like 150 directorial credits to your name, some of them are going to uh, slip by the wayside. <laughs> yeah, his, his instincts definitely feel like somebody who was part of the the Hollywood studio system of that time. So you know, very unsentimental. It's about like, okay, we got the scene, let's move on. And I think in a lot of ways, the films that become the classics are are. Um, are uh, informed by that they're they're made better by that sort of like instinct of like urgency like we got this let's move on and everything's got to move the plot forward and it's got to like all you know be coming towards like one end he has that sort of like is uh, the, the movies of his that work really have that sense of like kinetic forward motion because he's like got to keep moving he's got you know basically a, a shark he's got to keep moving or he's He's going to, you know, derail. And, and it's just it's just instinct, instinctual filmmaking. It's like it's like a Spielberg where you just when you just hear them talk, you just watch their movies. You just you just go, oh, there was no other way to shoot this. This was the exact right way to shoot it. There's no need to hem and haw. There's no need to, like, sit in a corner for like two days trying to figure out your shot. It's just here's the scene. We shoot it. It, it helps that you have Greg Toland uh, making a one of the most gorgeous movies uh, uh, I've seen this year on the podcast. Uh, but just having that like, all right, I got Greg Toland. How do we shoot it? All right, great. Let's go. It's funny you mentioned that, Tom, because one of my notes here, I'll read it verbatim, is uh, the thing with this film is much as it may not have flashy moments, it hits the big moments of the book just right. Like the scene with Grandpa's burial, you can't help but think, yeah, that's exactly how you shoot that. And so much of this, so many moments from the book that I remember watching it in this film, I just kept thinking, yeah, that's that's how you'd shoot that scene. Like, that's just, that's it. That's how you do it. There's no, you know, there's no need necessarily for, you know, talk about Greg Toland, you know, I look at what he does with Citizen Kane. It's very much expressionistic. It's very uh, un intentionally unreal. And yet he comes over to this film, or sorry, he did this film first. He's doing this film. And he still incorporates his same use of shadow and his same lighting techniques, but it makes it all feel so real and and honest, you know? Well, you're in that truck with them. 
Yeah, and you you, you know it's you, you, just, you just feel that journey. You're just you're just with them, and you know as much as there's moments where it feels like yeah they're clearly shooting on a set or whatever, uh, it, it never loses that sense of uh, the you know the gritty realism of being hungry and having to jump on a truck and travel halfway across a country just looking for the barest scraps that you know whatever rich people around will throw at you. And I, I think when you're making a movie about specifically about people's pain it you know it it behooves you to be as unartful and least as least bullshitty as possible to be as honest about that pain as you as you can conceivably be and so i think it lends itself very well to that sort of unpretentious sort of style uh you know you you don't want to like see the, the the real suffering that was happening at the time the film was made uh as like an opportunity to like show off your cinematic chops you know, you want to tell the reality of their pain, maybe at the sacrifice of some of your artistry. And it kind of, I mean, this is this is a, a proto version of what Victoria De Sica does and so many of those Italians with that neo-realist movement. You know, this this is, there, it's, it's, exactly. impossi- it's impossible to believe that uh, when uh, Victoria was making Bicycle Thieves, he was not thinking of this film. Well, you know. John Ford was definitely one of those guys that helped kickstart the auteur movement uh, that the Euro- those European filmmakers were starting to, you know, uh, spout. Uh, what, in the 50s or the 60s did they start with that? Well, yeah, that, I mean, the auteur theory kind of comes out of... Uh, of The French. You know, yeah, I mean, it's mostly propagated by the Cahiers Cinema guys who, but, you know, yeah. But, but you know, I mean, the French, I mean, the Italians after the war started ingesting all sorts of American films. Yeah. And even during the war, there was a big bootleg market of just buying films so you could kind of just watch it at home without sound. You were just looking at film. Um, there's no way these guys, all of these Europeans, weren't um, massively influenced by Ford. And especially uh, this movie, because uh, while we haven't had a war in on our home turf since uh, the Civil War... Uh, I feel like uh, post-war Europeans were definitely able to latch on to a story like Grapes of Wrath when they were uh, trying to rebuild after such a massive catastrophic event like World War II. I also, you know, the other interesting thing I was listening to, uh, I was listening to a commentary on this film, and they talked about how the main influence on the look of this film for, um, for Ford and Toland were the films of Pare Lorenz, uh, who is a name that is not particularly well known as some other uh, directors. He was a filmmaker uh, for FDR primarily. Uh, he's still up for his films like The Plow That Broke the Plains and The River, the latter of which we'll actually be covering on this show next season. He was a, a documentarian making these, I don't know what you want to call them, whether you want to call them informational films, propaganda films, what have you, but they were attempting to show the you know capture the reality of this era the dust bowl and the depression and i think that it's it's telling that ford and and toland were modeling their look off of a a documentary yeah. i think it's you know kind of interesting that this you know in addition at the time you have like these wpa works and and people trying to document the reality of the the great depression you also have the you know the other main movement is the exact opposite sort of the Busby Berkeley musicals, the escapist fantasies. Uh, and there's very little in between. It seems like there's, people are either like trying to document the stark reality of life in the country, or they're, they're, they're creating this, this sort of ebullient fantasy that, that doesn't really exist. And I, I think that that's kind of the, you know, ultimately isn't that's kind of to some degree, the, the Sullivan's travels dilemma uh, of, of I want to do something to help the working man, but the working man does not want to see their own lives reflected on screen. Working man wants the Busby Berkeley musical. Yeah, you know we, uh, you know, I mean, let's let's face it. A lot of us, uh, you know, h- how many people uh, are sitting down and so excited to uh, tomorrow morning instead of watching, uh, you know, more impeachment proceedings? They're really looking forward to watching a magic lady and a robot in a fake sitcom. You know, like that's what we're that's what we're gearing up for uh, to try and make all of. Yeah, what's I don't know that one necessarily negates the other. I think one makes the other sort of bearable. Well, that's why it's so interesting too that you know that this book is the hit that it is, and that this film was the hit that it was, 
I think because the one thing I found interesting, one anecdote was that Zanuck was apparently concerned that the film would be viewed as overtly communist uh, and, and very red and lefty. And so he sent private investigators to investigate the actual circumstances of the Okies and found that the circumstances they were living in were actually worse than what is described in the book. So he felt confident that nobody could call the movie, uh, you know, Pinko or, or Kami because it's just right. what it was. You it's know, just the reality um, of the situation. One element in the movie that really struck me was Tom Joad going, why do they keep calling us reds? What's a red that... Uh, this ploy by the rich to paint anybody looking for a fair shake as a red doesn't even like drift down to these Okies. They don't even like, they don't even know what this is. They're just like, well, I'm hungry. Why can't I work yeah. for food? And the idea just, that, right. That, that, a, that a guy with an eighth grade education, who's just like trying to feed his family. is like spending his time, like reading, you know, Marx and Engels. Yeah. And that's, you know, and it's in the book, if I remember correctly, it's even more like there's specifically a line of what's a red anybody that wants more wages than we're paying. Like it's yeah. it's direct about. Yeah, that. that that moment really struck me in the movie and just, um, you know, it, it, it could have been easy to not have that in the movie and just kind of have it like in the end, he kind of comes to uh, the same place that uh, the preacher uh, came to and without ever saying red or communism or whatever, it could have been easy to like leave that to the side because, well, we don't want to, we don't want to get brought up uh, in front of McCarthy, which, uh, you know, John Ford ended up doing because of this movie. It also helps that this is around the time of world war two, which is, and we've talked about this on other episodes. When we talked about Chaplin, we talked about other figures, which is, uh, around world war two, when we needed Russia's help, America suddenly got real cool about yeah. communists for like, a couple of years, and then, uh, you know, when when the World War II is over, suddenly they're going, hey, Charlie Chaplin, why the hell were you over in Russia? And why were you saying the commies are our friends? And Chaplin responds with, you told me to. You literally, that was the job. You, this is what you told me to do. So it is in that period that kind of takes a bit of the heat off this. People's memory is very short term. It's like, yeah, in, in 1940, it would have been like Charles Lindbergh or, any, you know, anybody who showed... You know, right right wing tendencies would have been like suspect. They would have been the people you 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 felt like you really couldn't trust. And then you know, obviously after you know the war and the, the you know the Cold War settled in, it became the exact opposite. They started like you know, um, they, they 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 started investigating everybody who had been brought in precisely because they had more leftist sympathies uh, before the war. That little bit of trivia about Zanuck sending in private eyes to investigate this stuff. You couldn't really say they were making shit up. So, like, you couldn't even, like, slander the movie. Like, oh, they're making stuff up because it's communist propaganda. Then they could have just pointed and said, no, look, look there. That's happening. We're even softening it because you people would lose your minds if you knew exactly what was happening. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's kind of, uh, you know, not to sound too overtly, uh, you know, look, this is this is the issue that we face then and we face now, which is. America just wants to pretend these things aren't happening. Uh, you know, that, that so many people who hold these beliefs, you know, who, who believe, oh, well, everybody, you know, it's not that bad. Everybody's making enough money. Everybody's fine. And if you're not making enough money, that's your own fault. This this very, you know, uh, bootstraps idea. We can only maintain it by not paying attention to what's happening. This happens again and again. You know, in, in 1960, Edward R. Murrow does Harvest of Shame on CBS showing, again, the plight of the migrant worker. And then, you know, less than a decade later, Cesar Chavez is leading uh, a movement to defend the migrant worker. Like, we just put these things out of our mind and forget about them. And, and even today, I mean, you know, uh, Mark satirizes it so well in his book about, you know, the, the wealthy literally retreating to an island where they don't have to see the poor. Like, that's the only way to get by in this stuff and, and not see a need for change and i think part of the problem is that the conventional wisdom is always out of date you know the conventional wisdom is what people remember being true from 20 or 30 years ago so you have like people who you know had their careers were productive adults in like the 80s and 90s in the 2000s and 2010s and 2020s you know well, why don't you just get a middle class job like i did 
You know, um, why don't you know, why are you working as a barista? Why do you have a Ph.D. and, and can't find, you know, a high paying job in the academic field of your choice? They don't understand that the world is different now than it was back then. So they still judge the, 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 the current climate under the standards that they remember it from and like the, uh, from, from when things are different. I think a lot of that was true also during the Depression. People who weren't directly affected, and a lot of people weren't, uh, they, they still remembered that their, their view of reality was formed in like the Roaring Twenties, the post-war prosperity after world war one and so they it didn't compute with them that like there were people who just could not find a job in the 1930s because there was none available or if they were living in a you know in a, a culvert in california because their 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 family had to flee the dust bowl in oklahoma that it, it had to be because of some great moral failing on their part and uh and i think part of what the value is of, of making films like this or and documenting the reality is that it goes towards creating a new conventional wisdom. It goes towards overturning the the outmoded, no longer true view of reality that the majority of people have. And it's 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 speaking to you know this film speaks to people on a on a on a base level on a on an emotional level, and so did so did the book. And I think that that's something when it comes to. Uh, advocating for social change, we kind of forget in terms of, I think sometimes we get a little too caught up in, uh, you know, I, I feel anyway, I hate to sound, you know, like an old man, but I feel like part of the issue with uh, my own millennial generation and trying to advocate for change is it seems like it's often done with the stance of, well, I'm right, therefore everyone's going to agree with me because I have the facts. And if you don't present those facts in a in a palatable way, uh, you know, like you were saying, Mark, about, you know, uh, a guy with an eighth grade education uh, under, reading Marx. I do think you could, you win, and they did, uh, FDR and Steinbeck won a lot more people over to the ideas of the New Deal and the ideas of, uh, you know, some sorts of socialist policies with a relatable story of the Okies in California right. than you ever could have by, han- you know, handing your average person on the street, the bread book or, you know, or Das Kapital, yeah, right. you know, you're, you're not, it's not about telling people the truth. It's about being the truth, you know, about, about giving them a reality <laughs> that, that they can't argue with. It's, it's why I loved, you know, to go back to your book for a second, like the, the character that really struck me in your, in your, uh, in billionaire Island was the, uh, I'm forgetting the, the character's name, but the, 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 the guy with the man bun and the beard and the flannel. The, you know, uh, the, yeah, the, the hipster, uh, yes. he's like sort of the hipster who got caught in the hamster cage. Uh, you know, he's probably like a programmer or, you know, somebody who had, had worked in like a graphic designer who had run afoul of, um, Rick Canto, the, the billionaire and ended up in the hamster cage, but still considers himself a subversive. And yet, you know, when push comes to shove, uh, retreats and that's kind of, you know, that that is something that we kind of forget. I mean, you know, I, I uh, have mentioned this before on other episodes, but, you know, I think about uh, where, you know, one of the things we have failed to to reconcile with in terms of making actual progress. We, we look at the baby boomers who have now turned out fairly uh, conservative and we wonder how the hell did, you know, nobody asks the question of how did they go from the guys yelling make love, not war and, and, and you know, at, at the anti-Vietnam protests to becoming uh, the people with the red hats cheering on the storming of the Capitol. Yeah. Like how there's sort that... of like, I think a, a, a symmetry to the, uh, to the ideological progression of the boomers where they started out sort of like, um, getting really cheap college education, uh, you know, almost free college education became very educated. And then, it, you know, took it for granted that they had the, the best social safety net in the, you know, in the history of the United States. And they dropped out and joined a cult. And then they, you know, uh, they, after a while in the cult, they got jobs. They became rich in like the eighties and nineties, and then they started watching. Then they instead of going to college, they they went to Fox News, watched Fox News for like a decade, and then joined a cult again. Uh, this time it was the Trump cult, and uh, and then you know they retired. And so it's it's like they're this sort of like idea that they're just they they they've, they've taken their their wealth and all their advantages for granted. And it, it made them sort of amenable to any lies which are which are flattering to them. I think there's also an element too, though, and I, I thought of this recently, which is you know, uh, I I have been coping with you know I I turned thirty this year, and I uh, you know I had recently watched The Big Chill again, 
Uh, and when I watched The Big Chill when I was 19, I went, I hate this movie. This is so self-indulgent. This is so narcissistic. Shut up, boomers, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And watching it at 30, uh, especially amidst, uh, you know, uh, you know, this is this is pre-election. We're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you know, and, and just realizing like, oh, no, no, no this is a movie about uh, people going, hey, our generation could have made a real difference, but we were too full of ourselves and narcissistic and we ended up uh, just making things worse. And I went, oh, I get it. I get it now. Yeah, this works. And I think that, you know, part of the thing that gets me with that, too, is I was thinking about, uh, you know, here we are, uh, people my age, people a little younger who are saying, like, we're never going to wind up like the boomers. We're never going to be like terrible, greedy capitalists. And then they go, hey, did you know you can invest in GameStop and make money short selling this? And we all went investing the stock market, Wall Street. We love it. And I, you know, I thought of that, uh, that that title card at the end of trial of the Chicago seven, that says Jerry Rubin became a stockbroker. And you're like, right. Yeah. Some of us just, this just kind of happens. Once you start making money, you forget about the other people. Well, That's I kind think of the, the message that was delivered to the boomers very early on from like their parents who had survived like the world war two and the great depression was that we suffered for you. You're worth it. We, you know, we want you to have things we never had. And so I think at some point they just sort of imbibed the message that, that they are um, the pharaohs atop the pyramid of human suffering, and that's their rightful place in the world. So the fact that like they took advantage of like this, this enormously generous social safety net and free college education, and and then when it becomes no longer useful to them because they've got their education, they're they they've made their money and they're ready to retire, and it's actually counterproductive to them because they're paying taxes to support the next generation having access to these things. Their, their idea is that the rest of us should be suffering to provide them with an even higher standard of living because that's what they've it's always been sort of what they've been told their whole lives but you know it turns out we didn't need it we're all doing fine right everything's right. great everything's great for 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 people like us we're all doing just just fine right I have not seen my loved ones in months uh it's it's everything's great it's good um but i i I think about you know even though the film and the book have not maybe endured the way that they, they should have, I do think about the fact that Tom Joad as a character has endured, you know, about the fact that, you know, how many, how many years ago was it Tom that, that uh, Bruce Springsteen wrote his ghost of Tom Joad song? Like uh, that must've been 26 years ago. I think that was mid nineties when he did yeah. the ghost of Tom Joad. And then, uh, you know, uh, did that cover re- redid it with uh, Tom Morello throwing his uh, rage against the machine magic against it. And uh, you know, I-, I think the people that um, are, um, would be amenable to the grapes of wrath and Tom Joad, uh, they end up finding it. And um, as much as it maybe may not dominate the conversation anymore uh, since it's induction in 1989. Um, I do think, uh, Pete, the right people find it, uh, and I, I hope uh, we help uh, push them in the in the right direction towards finding it. I mean, he's Tom Joad is kind of the the archetypical American hero in a way. I mean, I was I was reading up on um, on uh, I want to make sure I credit Robert Jewett and and uh, John Shelton Lawrence had this book called The American Monomyth, which kind of posited. You know, Joseph Campbell created his idea of the monomyth, but that there's this specific American story that we favor which they said was a community in harmonious paradise is threatened by an evil. Normal institutions fail to contend with the threat. A selfless superhero emerges to renounce temptations and carry out the redemptive task. Aided by fate, his decisive victory restores the community to its paradisical condition. The hero then recedes into obscurity. I mean, that at the end of the day is, is something that's present in so many Westerns, be it Shane or um, Fistful of Dollars. It in you know it it's a it's a superhero story it's so many stories and Tom Joad represents the most kind of grizzled version of that he he's the kind I mean he's a guy fresh out of jail on the wrong side of the law uh you know ready to ready to fight back the cops who are going after the little man uh and in the end swears yeah I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna you know he has the immortal monologue about you know wherever wherever people are. are uh, fighting so hard because they're hungry, I'll be there. That that classic speech. I mean, uh, that moment too was um, wasn't filmed like uh, 
like most i don't know like most ford scenes uh they kind of he kind of was just like all right you two need to like rehearse this and kind of get on the same track and then when you sit there i'm just gonna roll and then like you guys whenever you're ready just go for it and they did it and he was they were like yeah that's it you you guys did it and i mean what 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 else is there to say? I mean, freaking uh, Fonda kills it. Um, the actress who plays his mother kills it. Uh, th- there's a reason why Henry Fonda was there when Steinbeck won the Nobel Prize because Steinbeck said, yeah, he he is Tom Jode. He brought Tom Jode to life, which, uh, you know, again, it's funny since Henry Fonda was a, a very uh, conservative man in real life that he was able to find the humanity. Uh, I mean, he, like he fought to play Tom Jode. He, he never wanted to be a contract player. And uh, when he knew that this was being made, he was going to have to like suck it up and, and do it like a, what, a seven, eight picture deal with Fox to, to make the movie. Yeah. And he said, yeah, whatever. I don't care. This is a this is a career. of uh, This is a role of a lifetime. I don't care what I have to do to do it. So uh, he, it the gamble paid off. I mean, Jesus Christ, this is pro- I, like I love Henry Fonda and this is probably the best thing I've seen him in. They're closer, closer to Once Upon a Time in the West than I thought I'd ever see from him. Uh, um, whenever, yeah, I mean that speech and Tom Joad, you know the ghost of Tom Joad. Uh, I was so I just gotta say, um, because it goes to to a moment with Tom Joad and how he's ready to fight and kind of keeps always getting close to fucking up his life and ending up on the run again is when the cops just accidentally shoot that girl and him and the preacher beat up the cop. Uh, that scene really took me by surprise because one. You still get that sense of, oh, it's 1940. They're not going to just have someone get just shot, like some innocent person get shot in the chest. And then, no, cop just shot a woman in the chest. And yeah, he just did. And that's the moment that it re- this movie really took that leap for me. Like, not that I wasn't liking it before, but that was when I was really, I felt like, okay, these guys, John Ford knows what he's doing with this movie. And he knows how to lay these punches down because... I feel like for all the talk about Ford these days that he's a conservative and, you know, he's white supremacy and all that, whatever nonsense people like to spread. This movie is very much not like a pro cop movie. He, Oh no. He's very clearly laying out the connections between how police are used to uh, reinforce the supremacy of the rich. And, uh, for a guy who's been well known for being a Western guy and, Oh, he's, I, I found that scene very striking and it really hits. And I think it's really in line with like popular sentiment at the time too. I think it's easy to forget like people back then weren't cheering for the cops. They were cheering for like bank robbers. Yeah. Like, yeah. like when John Dillinger was shot, like a lot of people like, like were furious with the FBI. They would just shoot an unarmed man. They weren't glad this bank robber had been killed because in a lot of ways they saw in him the same sort of desires that they all had to like stick it to the system that had repossessed their house or that is, you know, taken back their farm or that was, was cheating them. So I think that in a lot of ways that was like an embodiment of a lot of popular angst at that time was like, like the system's not there to protect you. It's there to, to keep you in line. And, and, and it's even just in that moment when after she gets shot and the cops, the other, the backup comes and they just look down at this woman who just got shot in the chest. And the one cop just kind of shakes his head and goes, eh, what a mess those 45s make. Eh, I guess we should get a doctor. And, you know, what Mark was saying about it being the editor, it's we kind of forget even in other movies at the time. Uh, you know, one we did this season uh, a couple years prior to this, Modern Times, you know, we talked about how you know the cops are clearly the antagonists of it. Even something as simple as I was just reading, I, I have the um, the Fantagraphics volumes of uh, of the old Mickey Mouse comic strips, and if you look at those, uh, Mickey Mouse is always being hounded by a cop who is o- very often played by Peg Leg Pete or someone like Peg Leg Pete. Like it's it's it seemed like the conventional wisdom of like, yeah, these guys are an antagonistic force around that time, which we have very well, much it's lost. Fun, it, it wasn't even just that time, too, because, like, if you think about it, it really didn't start until, like, the 80s when it wasn't okay to make, like, the cops your bad guys. Like, 
1977, the number one movie of the year was Star Wars, right? But what was the number two movie of the year? Smokey and the Bandit, a movie where yep. a bootlegger is getting chased by a dipshit racist cop who beats his wife. And it was the number two movie. It was closer to Star Wars in box office than you would even think. And then just that started getting bled out of pop culture. It, it, like once the 80s and the Reagan era started and we started having every channel had five different cop shows and it was just, yeah, the cops are great where all of a sudden it just, you, you just can't do that unless it's like the specific point is, oh, there's corruption and this is bad, but look, there's a good cop to stop the corrupt cop. It, it, that shit lasted a lot longer than we thought. And feels like we need to get back to that. I don't know. I mean, Brooklyn Nine-Nine just got canceled today. This is maybe the central controversy of, you know, American civilization. It's like, who, who are you, should you be more afraid of your, your fellow Americans or the, uh, institutions, uh, you know, who's more likely to, uh, who needs to be reined in people or, or the institutions that supposedly serve them. And I think that's kind of the, the, maybe the central dilemma of American politics. And yet, at the same time, one thing that I find interesting is that what the movie is explicitly trying to do, where the book doesn't do it so directly, is the movie is also recognizing, and that's why it changes the ending, and that's why it ends with the good camp, is it's trying to basically say, it's trying to get a group of people and a country that feels like they have been failed by their government to now be on board for to invoke Ronald Reagan, the sentence that he uh, said was so terrible, but proved to be very good, especially at this time, you know, that phrase of I'm from the government and I'm here to help. I mean, it, it seems to me uh, no, uh, no coincidence that the man at the Department of Agri, the man from the Department of Agriculture at that good camp is modeled very clearly after FDR with the hair and the glasses. Like, I think he's very clearly meant to look like FDR. I think it's very clearly trying to convey, hey, the government's trying to help. We're trying to fix this. We're going to try and pass the New Deal. We're going to try and, and make policies that help people, which was not necessarily what people were seeing at the time or a sentiment that anybody felt at the but time. It, and yet it also feels clear-eyed enough to still say that it's not going to be uh, the be-all, end-all, that it's not going to like happen overnight, and it might not even work because it still ends with... Tom Joad on the run and his family having to leave this camp and looking for whatever scraps they can get with the hope that maybe it'll get better. But we don't know because even at the time in 1940, when they made nobody knew yeah. and who knew a year later, we'd be in a war, you know, and that uh, the war we got into was like the only just war <laughs> since the civil war. And then yeah. that war would be then, uh, when uh, American corporations realized, oh, war's a money maker. We can now destroy our country by just constantly getting into wars, feeding the poor youth into the war machine so we can make money. So it feels like, yeah, it's definitely doing an FDR thing at the end there, but also saying, I mean, maybe. I mean, because that guy was still kind of helping the cops trying to find Tom Joad at the end. So... I think it's that uh, pessimistic optimism that uh, made it connect so well, at least the movie. I, I and I think you know one thing I want to single out too while we're talking about this is is um, is because Tom, you mentioned the mother Jane Darwell is the actress who Jane plays Darwell, yeah. uh, the mother, and and she it's another one where I talk about oh this is this is exactly how you do this. I remember from the book the 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 sentiment where she talks about you know uh, when. Tom comes back from prison and saying, you know, uh, did they do anything to you? You know, sometimes they do something to you and you get mad, you get mean, but then they hurt you again and you get more mad and more mean. And then you ain't a man no more. Just a, a big uh, mean mad. And I think about just how that sentence alone <laughs> is more directly an indictment of uh, the American prison system than anything we've been able to muster today. Just just the way that she that that idea of having this this mother character show up and and when she sees her son she's not even relieved she's at first afraid that prison broke him i think it's such a powerful idea that she sells so well in this performance yeah it's a very eloquent reflection of a reality that that, that prison 
doesn't function so much as a collection of prisoners as it is as like turning people into prisoners. It, it takes people who were probably fairly functional and redeemable when they come in and turns them into people that can only exist within the the um, with w- within the premise of a prison or the people who are are now only going to be able to exist within the criminal justice system thereafter. That's another thing I think about when we talk about, you know, and Tom brought up Smokey and the Bandit or, or Dukes of Hazard or anything like that. There was this sentiment that, again, no longer exists, but Tom Joad embodies too, which is this idea of I, our literature and our cinema used to be much more accepting of the idea of, oh, yeah, if somebody went to, you know, a lot of folks go to prison and they go to prison because, well, they just got a bum rap and the system fucked them over. And now we just treat it like, well, if you went to jail, you obviously did a bad thing, and you yeah, are you're unhirable. You yeah. you can't get a job, and uh, and if you go to prison, even for minor crimes, you're more likely to go for like ten, twenty years. Whereas back then, even for violent crimes, people would usually only go for like a year or two, and then they would they would get out. And yeah, it was a very different approach. I think I think partly uh, because yeah, it became an industry. You know, it, people realized that that. There was money to be made, whether the prison is private, especially if it's a private prison, but even if it's not, there's money to be made out of like bleeding uh, the prisoners for free labor and their families for contributions to the system. In Alabama, this is still the case, and this is like a leftover from like the, uh, from, you know, basically the, the, the reconstruct or from the post reconstruction era. They, they give the sheriff, the, the local sheriff, X amount of money to feed the prisoners in the prison and whatever he doesn't spend on food, uh, he is free to keep. So, and this is like, obviously a throwback to like the chain gangs and whatnot, but a significant portion of the, uh, sheriff's, the County sheriff's income in the state of Alabama comes from like low balling the amount of food they're going to need to buy for prisoners so that they can, they can keep the surplus of what they didn't spend. I, the thing that strikes me about this and, and when I wonder, uh, why Grapes of Wrath didn't feel like it had the urgency anymore as it once did is that, you know, we mentioned at the beginning that we think of the Great Depression and the circumstances of the Great Depression as something that happened only at a particular point in time. And I think part of the reason that um, American society uh, and the American majority treat it that way is because it's not like the Tom Jodes and the Jode families of America stopped existing it's that they stopped being entirely white. I think that that's a huge issue in terms of like the fact that the narratives and the stories that you see about Tom Joad and his life, you know, the, the cruelties of America's prison system and the cruelties of Americans migra- American migrant workers uh, or the cruelties, cruelties uh, American migrant workers are subjected to were still going on. For, for decades and decades afterward, these things have not gone away. These broken systems have not gone away. It's just that the, uh, the quote-unquote, the lowest white people on the totem pole uh, are, are just trying to keep other people below them. Yeah, this is exactly how the, um, even though the New Deal was enormously popular and the policies that came from the New Deal end up setting up setting the stage for like a generation of American prosperity after, you know, the war, they, uh, the, the way they got white Americans to vote against these policies, and, uh, was by convincing themselves, by convincing them that, that they were, uh, benefiting black and non-white families to a greater degree. And it was like after, after the, the civil rights amendment basically sent the Southern white voters to the Republican party And, you know, Nixon's Southern strategy was basically to convince the white voters that this is the time to get rid of, begin getting rid of the New Deal policies and the, 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 um, social safety net that benefited them because it was all going to, you know, quote unquote, welfare queens, you know, because it was going to like some black single mother in Chicago and and not to your friends and neighbors there in West Virginia. It's, it's so fascinating too. Uh, you know, we did a film, uh, on here. Uh, a couple weeks back. It's actually, the episode is out today um, as we're recording this. Uh, Mark, have you ever seen Gordon Parks' The Learning Tree? No. It's it's on Criterion Channel now, and it's also to read online. Uh, it's, his, it's Gordon Parks' original film uh, before Shaft or any of that, and it's him depicting uh, basically his own coming-of-age story. 
And it's it's so fascinating because we talked about with our guest Larry Strong about how there is this uh, bar for all the you know the the black working class folks and the quote unquote white trash people all hang out there and there's no sense of of uh, racial resentment or or anything like that because it was just you know this idea of being united in being poor and on the outskirts of society and how you're right there was this this divide that got pushed that that nixon era southern strategy divide of just kind of really trying to reinforce the idea of it's it's not so much uh, about being uh you know that that a lot of people seem not motivated by wanting to be at the same level as the highest uh you know social sphere but just not wanting to be the lowest as long as they can keep somebody else beneath them it makes them feel uh, it makes them feel good, and I think yeah, it's that's... not a question of whether or not you're rich or poor. It's how you stand re- in relation. Your dignity is dependent upon where you stand in relation to people around you. Yeah, and that's I mean that's the fascinating thing is that the other element of grapes of wrath. You mentioned the word dignity. Is it's it is the idea of these people, the Okies, trying desperately to just have a shred of dignity. I mean, my favorite scene in the entire film is the is the two for a penny scene, and the way that pa jode is is insisting on no i want to i want to pay for this you know what the bread is the bread is is 10 cents cut me off five cents worth and he's just it's it's this this these people just wanting to feel like they're being treated as human beings that's that's what it all boils down to yeah yeah it was it was, it was heartbreaking it was a really great scene and, and yeah it was really just about somebody wanting the acknowledgement of their their common humanity I, and I think there's something too when I think of the films that try and approach, you know, uh, our our inherent flaws in the American system and the institutions. You know, I mean, Mark, one time oh, it was years ago now we did a panel because we were uh, seated next to each other on a stage, which is a thing that hasn't happened in a long time and will never happen again for a long time. But we were sitting in a room and other people were sitting there too. It's a foreign concept. And you said something uh, when you're talking about, I believe, Flintstones, where you're talking about the idea that we as people create these institutions and after a while we forget that they're supposed to serve us and not us serving them and i think that we kind of you know that's that's one of the things we 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 fail to reconcile with when we're even even in our media is is the idea of you know even something like citizen kane that is kind of you know emblematic of of one aspect of american uh, the, the flaw in american life that's putting it on this this one person and his greed and his lust for glory and grapes of wrath is really just kind of suggesting it's not about one person or or one person being bad it's the system we have created is broken right yeah yeah um citizen kane is very much about the moral failings of one person being at the, the core of what's wrong with the world and yeah you're, yeah grapes of wrath is completely opposite it's about the uh the the broken institutions are being what what corrupts people's souls I, I was thinking about two um, because I had uh, when we were prepping for the podcast, I watched Grapes of Wrath uh, back when we were starting the season. And then I uh, over quarantine began watching uh, watching um, Jean-Luc Godard's Histoire du Cinema. And in one of the episodes, I think it's the fifth, he's talking about uh, Rome Open City. Right. Uh, the wrestling game, and he says this quote he has that I think is so great about Rome Open City is he says, with Rome Open City, Italy won back the right to look itself in the mirror. And when I watched Grapes of Wrath again, I was thinking about that quote, and I was thinking about how Grapes of Wrath is a movie in in its direct and blunt confrontation of the flaws in our system and you know the way that we allow so many people to languish in poverty uh, as long as we just don't have to look at them. I, I just kept thinking about this is the kind of film and and confronting this kind of thing is the kind of thing that for a moment in America won back the right to look itself in the mirror. And I don't think we have that right now, <laughs> but and I don't know, no. you know, it, it doesn't fix everything. Obviously, it doesn't really fix anything. But by looking at yourself, honestly, by being honest about what you've done, you then have earn the right to be taken seriously as somebody who might want to fix what you've done. 
I does anybody else have anything they want to touch on directly before we move into like the little wrap up Oscar talk? Yeah, just um, two things. One is quick. Uh, have to bring it up because it's a scene, the one scene that has my man Ward Bond in it. Um, <laughs> I, I do genuinely love the scene where they go into town and the cop stops them and it's Ward Bond and they start bonding over like, oh, we're from the same town and blah, blah, blah. And you could see he's like, oh, yeah, he's just he's kind of treating them like human beings. And then he snaps and realizes, oh, wait, they're Okies. I'm a cop. So like now there's a difference between us and I have to like push them along. I thought um, that was another really just striking scene that goes to the the thing we were talking about, how uh, the being fearful of the cops and how the cops are kind of tools of the uh, the uh, the the patriarchy, the uh, the higher society. Um, but uh, the the th- the other thing that really did strike me towards the end when they go to the uh, the farm where there's the strike is that. It manages to be pro-union, and yet it doesn't throw, like, you know, quote-unquote scabs under the bus because it's still saying, well, there's these are people that are desperate and dying and hungry, and they don't even know what's going on. So they're not really doing anything wrong morally. They're just, they're just desperate. And you understand their desperation. And even Tom Joad, when he's under the bridge with the preacher, and he's like, you think my pa's going to give up five cents a barrel because other people are hungry when his family's hungry? I don't know. I found that balance really interesting and kind of a welcome change from what I feel like other movies would have done, which would have been to really throw the scabs under the bus and make them morally uh, inferior Instead, it finds that balance of, no, like, we get it. We we understand where these people are coming from. And also going to great lengths to show that uh, the farmers are doing everything they can to not give them the information that they're not paying those people, right? So we'll use you guys until we break them. Then we'll start paying you idiots to, to, uh, to, uh, two cents, <laughs> Uh, uh, we'll, we'll pay you half once we get the situation settled. And I don't know. I thought that was, you know, pretty great to show that there is a humanity to everybody in, in, in this situation. I mean, not the fucking farmers, obviously, but everybody on the bottom is to, it should be in this together, but we get why there's this divide, even if it isn't really so much a divide and so much just desperation forcing people to make decisions they maybe shouldn't be making yeah and i think it's it's part of the thing and and what we're getting at here with this too is is what i am drawn to with this film and and things of it's look is it's never sanctimonious no. you know i think that when people uh you know outside the fox news crowd when you have your kind of middle america people who complain about uh quote unquote smug liberals uh it's because it's easy to be uh, sanctimonious. It's easy to be pretentious. It's easy to, uh, you know, come out of come out of college with your with your bachelor's or your master's, having read all the socialist philosophy, and kind of talk down to people and and be like, I know what's right for you, and I understand, and I this and that, and it puts people off. And what's so appealing about what Steinbeck does is he's there's compassion, there's understanding, and in that sense he's able to reach people. He's able to actually reach people because he's not interested in sounding smart or sounding superior. He's interested in actually trying to affect change and, and, and speak to people, you know, which I think is, is powerful. But yeah. One thing that sort of ideological smugness really kind of ignores is how poor people are co-opted into, you know, working against each other about how they are, uh, you know, a lot of what well, we're, we're put in the antagonist, positions against each other because it's useful and it's not necessarily because you know we are ideologically opposed or whatnot it's just that we've been we've been we've been trained we're well-trained peasants and part of what the peasants are trained to do is to keep each other in line one thing we always do when we talk about it we talk about how these things fared at the oscars and and you would think truthfully this feels like well of course this this uh one best picture of course this won all these things obviously it just feels you know when people talk about uh, you know, the Oscar movies, this feels right. But in fact, uh, while Grapes of Wrath was nominated for Best Picture, it was nominated alongside All This in Heaven 2, Foreign Correspondent, 
The Great Dictator, Kitty Foyle, The Letter, The Long Voyage Home, Our Town, Philadelphia Story, and what won Best Picture that year, Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. Oh. So, so Grapes of Wrath lost Best Picture to Rebecca. It won Best Director for Ford. In an interesting twist, Henry Fonda was nominated for Best Actor for his performance as Tom Joad, but lost to James Stewart for The Philadelphia Story, which many people considered uh, a makeup Oscar to Stewart, who had lost in 1939 for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. He lost to Robert Dinot from Goodbye, Mr. Chips. It was nominated for and won Best Supporting Actress for Jane Darwell. It was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, but lost to The Philadelphia Story. Up for Best Sound Recording, but lost to Strike Up the Band, and was up for Best Film Editing, but lost to Northwest Mounted Police. Wow, lost a lot of Oscars. Yeah. Uh, One thing I think is worth noting, that I think is interesting, is that Ford has two Best Picture nominees that year, because he also has The Long Voyage Home. He made both those films in that year. So he Uh, sort of canceled himself out? Well, that's the thing. But Sam Wood also has two nominees that year for Our Town and Kitty Foyle. And Hitchcock was up twice for Foreign Correspondent and what won Rebecca. So it's it that's kind of a weird, interesting crossover. Now, what I thought was interesting looking at it, and I, I hate to sound so decisive, but interestingly, I would give Grapes of Wrath picture over Rebecca. I would give Grapes of Wrath many things over Rebecca. And yet, I would probably give Judith Anderson and Rebecca Best Supporting Actress over Jane Darwell for Grapes, even though I, I think Jane Darwell is great in this. It's a very weird way that this all worked out with this one. Yeah. Um, I would have given this picture, but uh, in the whatever you know puzzle logic you wanted to give the Oscars, I would have given Hitchcock director for for Rebecca still, just because uh, I don't know that movie's pretty much uh, a director's uh, self indulgence, just going for the uh, going for broke with his directorial ticks and everything. So I don't know, but hey, Grapes of Wrath, it's a uh, it's, I mean, it's lasted and also kind of not lasted. I don't know, but it's a great goddamn movie and uh, led to some. I feel like we could have, we could continue talking about this for like the the next yeah. three hours. But uh, and listen, if it makes you feel better, Tom, uh, John Ford wins Best Picture the following year uh, for How Green Was My Valley, which uh, I think it's generally agreed upon was the best picture that year. I mean, right? Nobody talks about anything else but How Green Is My Valley. Precisely. Right. <laughs> all all the Valley fans. Well, we're doing How Green Was My Valley next season, so we'll see where it stands for you, Tom. But in the meantime, Mark, I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank oh, you. Oh, my man. pleasure. Uh, great conversation. Thank you. And folks can check out uh, Billionaire Island, Second Coming, and the Second Second Coming Coming uh, at, at Ahoy Comics, and they can follow you on Twitter at ManRuss. Yes. Anything else you want to plug or just that? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm also doing um, Superman versus Imperious Lex with my uh, Flintstones artist, Steve Pugh. Uh, it's out on the stands now. Fantastic. Superman, is that like a, that's a, is that a new character or is that? Yeah, yeah, it's something I came up with. Great. Yeah, that sounds cool. Sounds fun. <laughs> Mark, thanks so much for joining us. This is great. All right. Thank you. I've been trying to think about why this film in particular was selected, try to sort of figure out the significance. Obviously, we've talked about a lot of the suppression of the socialist ideas of it. Um, The one thing I wanted to pose to you guys is how often it is that we see a film, a a meter, a, a film that is based off a book and is produced so quickly. Because if I remember correctly, the book comes out in... It's April of 39, right? And the film itself is like at the beginning of 1940. It's only like an eight or nine month turnaround. And I'm sort of like wondering, I guess that had me thinking like, is one of the ways that you could look at Rapes of Wrath and why it is chosen as one of the first 25 films to be preserved is in a way the legacy of it being a book to film adaptation. And I know that we have this with Gone with the Wind, um, I know uh, that it's probably about like a three year development between that, um, but this is the one that seems like even in the trailer um, for this movie, they make it apparent that it's like this book 
is so influential and you just cannot get enough of it. And they're like, they want you to know that like 20th century Fox is going to such extreme lengths to like make this movie. Like, and they're like, they're just so proud of it. And I'm just, it was just sort of kind of interesting seeing it now. Yeah. And I guess I just sort of wondered what you guys kind of, kind of thought about that. Um, I think part of it is that, uh, I mean, look, we still have it from time to time that books are such huge sensations that studios buy them up. In some cases, they buy them up before the books are even published. Uh, you know, uh, or something like The Martian was such a big hit that Fox, I think it was Fox did The Martian, right? Whoever uh, yeah. it was. Yeah. That like, they were like, we have to do, we have to make this. I think that the reason it feels like even more of an event with something like Gone with the Winter Grapes of Wrath is quite frankly that we have a more literary we we had a more literary country back then and maybe that's just because lack of options uh you know you had the radio and, and the movies but you know people their books could become a sensation a lot they or a much bigger sensation than they are now i mean now I, I there were so many times where they go you know and i try to i consider myself fairly aware of what's going on there are times where they turn around and go, ah, this film adaptation of the hugely popular book. And I went, I have no idea what this, I have never heard of the snowman until you showed me the trailer for this movie that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. I think that those literary sensations still happen, but they are few and far between. And I think in the last couple of, you know, in the last decade or so, most of those ended up being young adult adaptations. Most of those ended up being, I mean, think about it. As soon as Harry Potter became a hit in America, there was so much... Fa the, the fascination with who is going to play the characters in Harry Potter was on par with the national excitement over who is going to play Scarlett O'Hara uh, in, in the 30s. Uh, same with Hunger Games. Same with Twilight. In terms of adult novels, I don't know. Maybe part of that, too, is the fact that, quite frankly, when you're adapting novels now... They usually wind up on television. I, I'm thinking of like the last couple of like, oh, this book is popular and it's being adapted. It ends up being like Little Fires Everywhere and Pretty, uh, not Pretty Little Lies, uh, Big Little Lies and this year's The Undoing. I think that they end up going to television a lot more. I don't know. We're supposed to have The Girl in the Window this year. So that's that's something. But yeah, I don't, I just, I'm trying to think of the last like adult literary sensation that became a movie and you're either looking at Fifty Shades of Grey or The Da Vinci yeah. Code. But either way, as soon as those things were like bestsellers, somebody optioned the rights. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's still a, a if the, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's still a thing. I think it's just a matter of, I, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's more the case of, I think there, you know, if you go back in film history, there are a lot of adaptations of novels or adaptations of plays that are marketed the same way this one was but they were just not good adaptations, so we forgot about them. Sure. And I think that that's still the case now. There are probably going to be some things that we sit back and, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, if any of us have, have children, and they just go, what was a girl with a dragon tattoo? And we're like, it was a thing. We were all yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the author just up and died. Yeah, yeah. And then we didn't know what to do. Yeah, and then we adapted it twice to mixed results. Um, I don't know. Tom, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's really just changing of the the way filmmaking this studio system works what really is marketable for theaters nowadays i mean what honestly probably the last time this shit was really uh even possible was gone girl yeah yeah um, yeah i mean we don't really have these runaway surprise uh less than a hundred million dollar blockbuster movies anymore um yeah, like you said, uh, you know, uh, Nicole Kidman and Reese Witherspoon have been doing all these things on TV, on HBO now. I mean, oh, God, probably the best, maybe one of the best, if not, you know, the best Stephen King thing in the last few years has been The Outsider. Uh, they keep trying to do Stephen King as uh, anybody who had to suffer through the latest version of The Stand uh is very much aware. I think it's also just now that we know, now that TV's not like a joke or something someone does if they're not, you know, quote unquote, good enough to be a movie star or whatever. And now that TV uh, is like a legitimate offer and we could throw money at, we realize that like, okay, these big gigantic books uh, 
that don't work when you condense a thousand pages into a 90 page screenplay we could actually let breathe with the right production values and actually get something good out of them and you know i mean there's still room for movies based on books uh i don't think we'd need a 10 hour slow as molasses version of the grapes of wrath on netflix where you know you don't find out tom jode committed homicide until episode four <laughs> um but uh i think for the most part it's uh changing economics ch uh the changing of the mediums the importance of said mediums people tend to more uh more interested in adult storytelling in tv than they are in the movies these days uh also, that's just what studios are making. You know, it's. I, I just want to make this. I want to make this point because I think it's interesting. I just looked this up. Um, we're recording this on uh, February 11th, and I want to point this out because I'm looking right now. And to your point, Kyle, uh, I'm looking, and the top five books on the New York Times bestseller list: number five, Firefly Lane, and number two, The Duke and I, are both uh, TV series right now. It's Firefly Lane, and then The Duke and I is the first book in Bridgerton. So it looks like so many of these things. Number four is is the 36th book in the Alex Delaware series. Uh, so that's not going to get up anytime soon. But like Firefly Lane, Bridgerton, these things are are going to TV instead of, instead of uh, the big screen. Ironically, sure. yeah, but ironically, number one this week as we're recording this is uh, a book about the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Uh, called The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. Um, but, like, you know, just looking at this, like, these, this is where it's going. Uh, hardcover fiction, number three, The Vanishing Half is getting, has, has already been optioned. Um, and that was one that I ended up hearing about. My, uh, my significant other's been, been reading that. She's hooked on that. But that's, again, that's, you know, these things get picked up, but it's going to TV most times. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Tom, but I wanted to make sure I, I registered that point about the things that are currently selling no i mean i just you know i think uh yeah it's it's just different i mean it's still gonna happen you know i mean uh spielberg's will still take a book and you know make something out of it you know squish says he's doing that now with the book uh about what what's i forget what it's called if it even gets made that apple picked up about the native yeah. american killings um i i i don't know i mean i don't know if that's necessarily why <laughs> Uh, this was sort of uh, yanked out and thrown into the first year or anything because 1989, nobody still really gave a shit about TV or like so books were really the only thing. Movies were the only way you're doing books in any legitimate way. I mean, time has certainly made it so that this is one of this great uh, book to screen yeah. translations uh, that is an increasingly rare and um, one that isn't even discussed about let's do it again because everybody could just say why did the, this movie exists yeah you don't need it's not like you need to redo the special effects or anything is anybody really i mean i'm sure there's some people you know some people that you know live in very red voting areas who really want to see uh a dying homeless man sucking on some breast fell titties but like i don't i mean we don't really need to change much from this movie so i i don't i don't know i mean hey John Ford, when he cared, he knew how to make them. To wrap up like we usually do, uh, what films would you guys include in the registry? Remember, it must be an American film that's at least 10 years old. For my pick, I don't know. You know, I was having a hard time with this one, to be honest, uh, just because I love this movie so much. So, like, trying to find anything that's very similar to it to pair up with it was kind of, like, hard for me because it, it just kept coming up with, uh, well, it's not as good as this one, so do I pick, pick it? Um... So I was just kind of going through, you know, the giant wall of crap behind me and looking at stuff, trying to get some uh, inspiration. And I came upon a movie that um, I feel is of a lineage that the filmmaker definitely had this movie in mind for uh, more ways than one. In a very particular way, one was very personal. Um, it's a, a, a more of a traditional Western than this movie because uh, John Ford made it. So there's a kind of a Western tradition to Grapes of Wrath. Um, but this is a traditional Western. But even then, it's not even a traditional Western. This was in the post spaghetti, post Easy Rider world where movies were starting to change and we could start doing things that weren't just 
Uh, oh, it's a Western, so it's got to be shoot 'em up. And there's a black hat and a white hat. And uh, this one was let's be a little more complicated. Let's uh, make it quiet. Let's make it about characters. Let's not do just simple stuff like that. Uh, it's a movie directed, the first movie directed by this person, coming off of the success, the huge world shattering success of um, Easy Rider. Uh, Peter Fonda decided to direct a movie at the same time Dennis Hopper was directing his follow-up to Easy Rider. And uh, they went in very, very different directions. And I think this movie's much better than what Dennis Hopper did. I think it's better than Easy Rider, to be honest. Peter Fonda directed a movie called The Hired Hand. Uh, it's a movie that wasn't a huge hit. It kind of helped uh, destroy Universal's uh, initial efforts that got easy writer made of let's make these weird little movies for the long hairs or whatever and that kind of put an end to it between that and the last movie uh that hopper did uh it's a quiet contemplative movie that's very much about like america capitalistic societies our place in the world unsurprisingly peter fonda the son of henry fonda uh, at tom jode's offspring himself is playing a kind of Tom Joad esque character here. I think it's a beautiful movie. It's a lyrical movie. It's very sad. Uh, I think it's very much of a piece. I, th I feel like uh, Steinbeck probably would have loved this. Uh, I think I read somewhere that uh, Henry Fonda didn't really get it, but ultimately, as time went on, Velt was very proud of his son for making it. I think it's just a great movie and. I feel like anybody who's seen it has been immensely influenced by it. So, like, uh, you know, our fathers may not have seen it. Although, then again, my father might have just stumbled into it on 42nd Street one day. I mean, this is the guy who's like, yeah, I saw the three-hour cut of Once Upon a Time in America. I'm like, how did you see that movie in America? It wasn't released that way in America. He goes, well, I did. Okay. Um, so, could they could have stumbled on 42nd Street. I doubt it. But, like... I mean, you could even feel this goddamn movie's influence in fucking Red Dead Redemption. I mean, this is like a movie when you see it, you kind of just have no choice but to love it. Peter Fonda or Warren, Warren Oates. I mean, always, always glad to see Warren Oates in something. So while it's not an exact one-to-one, -one, I think there's enough blood, uh, shared genetic blood in, in between these two, not just from the Fonda connection, which, I mean, is enough but uh, I think there's a lot to this movie that... And I think it's an important movie. I genuinely think it's an important movie. I feel like it influenced a lot of stuff. And I think uh, if you want to talk about Easy Rider, I feel like you can't not talk about uh, this movie and how it uh, came from that movie's success. So uh, The Hired Hand. Uh, there's a great Blu-ray available done by Arrow Video on their Arrow Academy sub-label. Um, check it out. I think it's... Uh, kind of a quiet masterpiece and uh if you're in the mood after uh for some stuff slow burning oaky stuff like uh like this after grapes of wrath you'll be in for a hell of a treat so my pick is uh is not what i necessarily expected at the start you know i i could have gone for something simple uh you know i was debating something like reds uh, which is a movie i love and no one uh talks about now but is exceptional the warren Beatty film but i started really thinking about the story of Tom Joad and the story of the Grapes of Wrath, and particularly these migrant farmers. And I was struck by the fact that we are only, you know, if we are taught about the struggle of the migrant farmer in America, we are only taught about it uh, in regards to the Dust Bowl. Uh, and then it's like, hey, and then everything got better and it was fine. And that's not true. Um, I was thinking about how recently, or at least recently as we're recording this, President Biden took office and uh, sent a message by placing a bust behind his desk of Cesar Chavez, um, one of the pivotal uh, labor organizers and activists in American history, whom, um, at least in my public school education, uh, we learned nothing about. Not a single thing about Cesar Chavez. We learned nothing about the uh, the Chicano movement, the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement, we learned nothing about it. And I had become interested in Chavez, and and despite him being a pivotal figure in American history, 
he doesn't have uh, an array of, of films and biopics and documentaries. Uh, Diego Luna made a, a film um, with Michael Pena uh, back in 2014 that was fine, but it was the, the best we got. And so a while back, I had been looking into trying to find footage of, of Chavez and documentaries, and there's even there's not even good documentaries about him, which is shocking for such an important figure. And it had been done to some degree. There was a PBS series in the 90s that I was considering. And then I was trying to find, I was trying to find uh, a film by Academy Award winner Mark Jonathan Harris, who had made Into the Arms of Strangers and the Redwoods, uh, which is an hour long documentary called Huelga. And in my search for his film, I stumbled across this film, a different film entitled Huelga that is uh, directed by people named Richard Marson, Richard Murchison and David Holden. It is 15 minutes long. It is showing footage of uh, the Delano strike of 1966, but it's also showing footage of um, the landmark uh, El Teatro Campesino, which is um, Luis Valdez's theater company. Luis Valdez is represented in the registry with things like Zoot Suit and La Bamba, but this was his theater company, and in one of my favorite things, during the Delano strike, uh, El Teatro Campesino was founded performing skits that were essentially mocking uh, the overseers and the, the farm owners in a way to kind of encourage people to unionize and encourage people to fight back. Uh, Cesar Chavez and, and El Teatro Campesino are our are, are real world uh, Tom Joad fighting injustice and we know nothing about them and I, I i say all this to say i was struck by this footage uh that's in there and the footage is all narrated by chavez and you get to see the teatro campesino doing their skits and there's incredible footage of the protests and people out front saying why won't you let our workers speak to us you know why won't you why won't you pay them a living wage you say you can't afford it but clearly you can and what i found so remarkable about this about this 15 minute film Huelga, is that it exists you can watch it you can look it up but at the same time, there's no IMDb entry for it. There's no IMDb page for Richard Marchison or David Holden. It is a completely forgotten film that nevertheless has some of the best and most engrossing footage of Cesar Chavez and the Delano strike and El Teatro Campesino. Uh, it, it's, it's such a vital thing and, uh, to, to have and to preserve, and you wouldn't even know it existed. You would not know this film existed, which is truly mind-boggling to me so in the way that the registry preserves things like the incredible footage in in freedom riders or, or some of things uh, i think it's absolutely necessary to preserve something from um cesar chavez's uh efforts and triumph in securing better rights for for migrant laborers in the 60s and i think that this richard murchison david holden film quelga not only deserves to be seen, but it deserves to be recognized in academia, it deserves to be on IMDb, and it absolutely deserves to be in the National Film Registry. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Mark Russell for joining us. Check out his books, Billionaire Island and Second Coming from Ahoy Comics, wherever you get your comic books. You can also follow him on social media at ManRuss. You can also follow our co-hosts on social media, where you can find Mike at NKOAS and Tom at Raging Bull 1990 while you're there, be sure to follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at YMO Podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. It really helps a little show like ours. If you know some friends who might like the show, tell them about it. And if you have someone who you think would make a great guest for an upcoming film, tell us about it at yourmissingoutpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time.